Welcome to the RF Elements Unlicensed Podcast. As always, I'm Caleb. We got Tassos over here. Say hi, Tassos. Hey, 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 everybody. And this week, we have a very exciting conversation with David Zumwalt from WISPA. He is the new CEO and president, and he's here to talk about all these exciting times at which he's taken the helm. So there's a lot going on <laughs> in the industry, for sure, regulatory um, technical, uh, we've got Whisper Palooza coming up. So I think we've got a lot of really good topics to go over and discuss. So before we hop into the conversation, Toss says, give the good people out there their call to action. Absolutely. Don't forget to like, listen, or subscribe to our channel right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcasts like Apple, Spotify, or Google. All right, all right. Well, let's get froggy and jump to it. So, like I said, we've got David here from Wispa. Uh, say hey to the crowd, David. Hey, Hello, everybody. crowd. David here. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. No place I'd rather be right now. <laughs> great, great. So, David, uh, if you could give everyone kind of a quick history of you know how you've come up, uh, not just within WISPA, but the industry as a whole, you know, you've got a very rich sort of history, ton of experience and everything. So kind of give the, the folks out there a view of how you've gotten here and uh, where you're looking to take things right now. So coming through school, I knew I wanted to be involved in telecommunications and I had a lot of family sort of influence, a grandfather that worked his entire career at AT&T, Southwestern Bell, an uncle did the same thing. My dad was in petroleum, but also kind of engineering and technology oriented. And so coming out of school, I had an opportunity to go work in kind of a large company environment, did that on an internship basis. But then I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial. And at that time, we were just beginning to see the emergence of the competitive telecommunications landscape. This is when MCI and Southern Pacific Communications, later called Sprint, were coming into being. We were seeing the first long distance networks privatized and open for uh, competition. Uh, so very, very heady times. This is when frequency coordination at the FCC was beginning to really take hold for uh, companies that were either common carrier or private uh, commercial users working with the FCC to get paths for various spectrum uh, uh, and uh, I, I was smitten being able to work in that kind of an environment to see what was happening in communications. Even at that time, I knew that this is where I wanted to spend the bulk of my career. So I had an opportunity for the first four years as a professional to work with a company called CompuCon, which was um, uh, primarily uh, expert in terrestrial microwaves, some satellite earth station work. Uh, the frequency coordination work with the FCC and also land mobile public safety radio. Um, <clears throat> then through acquisitions, Com CompuCon is now part of ComSearch, so it still has a, a legacy that people would recognize. But I had an opportunity to start my own business called CNET in 1985. It's not the one that people see today. I get that <laughs> question a lot, but we were the first on the name. And um, we provided services to the emerging cellular industry. So we were working with the non-wireline and wireline carriers both. We ended up um, having as customers a majority of what were then called the Bell Operating Companies. And we provided engineering software for them to both uh, design from an RF perspective uh, and also from a network perspective and then manage uh, their networks as they grew. We rode their coattails as they began to work overseas as the uh, international carriers privatized. And so we ended up ultimately deploying our software in about 40 countries around the world. And I sold that business in 1997. And so I had my first sort of start to finish successful exit. After that, I got involved in private equity kind of at the earlier stage. Also, I was a participant in a venture fund in North Texas. Uh, loved doing that. It made it possible for me to start a family. Uh, funny thing is, you know, CNET, when you're working uh, 100 hours a week, and that's no kidding, my wife was actually keeping score for a while. <laughs> it, it just, you, you have to have time for conjugal visits if you're actually going to you know, have kids. And so uh, <laughs> switching and maybe downshifting a little bit made it possible for us to uh, raise two great kids who are now young adults. And they're kind of out on their own, <clears throat> doing their own thing these days. Um, so did that for a while. And then I got a call from someone I didn't know, a recruiter, 
who was looking for somebody with my background, which already kind of looks strange if you think about it. You know, yes, it's telecommunications that's there, but then he's sort of in the financial services industry. What is up with that? And the recruiter spotted me and said, we have uh, a need for somebody just like you in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And uh, I thought, well, this could be interesting. What's this about? And it was actually an economic development program that had gotten started. Uh, the Virgin Islands, as a lot of places in the Eastern Caribbean, very concerned about brain drain because bright kids growing up in these island communities often find that they have to leave in order to pursue their careers. And then once they come to some place like the continental US, they can't get back because there's nothing for them there. So the government of the Virgin Islands, the University of the Virgin Islands and the private sector all came together in a plan to promote economic diversification by you know, creating this economic development program. So I went down to kick the tires. Uh, we had visited the Caribbean frequently. We used to have management offsites down there. This was not my first time to be in the uh, Virgin Islands. But what I discovered was that the basis for their ask was actually very solid. The uh, backbone of the global internet is uh, optical fiber running along the sea floor. So submarine optical fi fiber <clears throat> at the time, and I think it's still true today, the um, second largest concentration of bandwidth in the Western Hemisphere resides on the island of St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Wow. And it's where North America, South America, Central America, and, and Europe actually kind of come together and traffic is switched. It's the uh, fastest path between the financial capitals of New York City and Sao Paulo, Brazil. A lot goes on there. But those fiber landings were created to... Uh, uh, you know, move traffic globally, not for the benefit of the Virgin Islands. And thus, that's the reason for the Economic Development Program. So we launched that program, <clears throat> did that for nine years. So now I've got some economic development uh, uh, experience. But more, more importantly, when we talk about, because we'll get into this later, public-private partnerships, you know, people can throw those terms around, but they mean different yep. things, different people. In my case, I was at the helm of a public, private, and academic partnership. And so if you think keeping two partners aligned is hard, <laughs> add a third and you're really hurting cats. And that's yeah. the reason I no longer have any here. But um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, that had run its course. We knew we weren't going to be there forever. We were looking for a way to come back uh, stateside uh, for a variety of reasons, including uh, for uh, family reasons. And so at the end of 2015, did that kind of re-entered the private equity space, you know, working with emerging technology companies again. And then I got a call from Broadband BI, uh, one of the uh, WISP, uh, the major WISP in the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, in 2018 <clears throat> with an invitation to come help the company prepare for scale. Um, so they saw opportunities coming, sort of like a combination of RDOF and CAF. In the case of the Virgin Islands, it's called uh, Connect USVI. And so uh, we uh, uh, submitted an application, very detailed application for that, and won it uh, for a massive expansion of connectivity uh, through the Virgin Islands. And then late last year, uh, the we arranged, negotiated an exit. The company was acquired by Liberty Latin America. Uh, and so it's now part of the Liberty family of companies. So I helped in the transition for a few months. At about that time, WISPA was looking, and that's how I ended up with WISPA. Now, I know I took you a long way around the horn on that to give you some background. Sorry if that went too long, but I, I know I get questions a lot about, well, who is this guy? And does he really understand yeah. the WISP industry? And where did he come from? And you know, what does he know? Um, and I get it. I, I think that that's, <laughs> if I were... You know, a WISP looking for uh, you know, answers to questions about where WISP is going and have the, the same sort of question um, for somebody like me. There is one other story I wanted to share uh, because uh, this is timely as well. Uh, we've seen, for example, that uh, there's now a requirement for the BDC filings for certification by a professional engineer or someone who has uh, a title like a certified uh, engineer. Uh, for the record, I'm a professional engineer, but I need to tell you the story of how that happens so that those who want to throw <laughs> bricks can uh, you know, hold on for a minute and see that I'm actually going to be able to split the middle here. 
but came out of school with a double E degree and uh, really saw no need to pursue a professional engineering uh, registration. Uh, the tests, for example, don't test for telecommunications. They still don't. And yep. so uh, you'll find PEs mostly in areas that involve structure or civil engineering mm -hmm. or you know chemical, things like this, power systems. <clears throat> but for the most part, you don't find PEs in telecom. When I started CNET, I started it out of my house in Garland, Texas, which was then a GTE territory. And so as a business, you get a free one-line listing in the Yellow Pages. I didn't need a listing in the Yellow Pages because our customers already knew who we were, but the uh, agent was insistent and said, we have to figure out where you go because you get classified in the Yellow Pages. But I said, well, we provide software for communications engineering, we're really consultants. And so uh, the rep said, okay, we've got a communication consultants category, we'll put you there. And I said, fine, you know, <laughs> get off the phone. I don't need to spend more time with this. But a couple of years later, a little less than two years, we had grown, outgrown my house and we moved into real office space in Richardson, Texas, which was the Southwestern Bell Territory. And at that point, we had hired an office manager and administrator. And so she's the one who took the call from Southwestern Bell and they said, hey, you got a free one line list, listing Yellow Pages. So she said, just do what we did before. Southwestern Bell said, we don't talk to GT. We're competitors. Just you know, tell us something about your business and we'll figure this out. And I got all this later after I got in trouble, because that, which is where I'm going with this story. <laughs> um, and she said, well, we write software for communications engineers. And the agent said, we've got a category for communications engineers. We'll put you there. And she's like, fine. But when the Yellow Pages were published, the Texas State Board of Registration for Professional Engineers had someone assigned to look through all the Yellow Pages and to look at every single business that was listed under an engineering classification and then go figure out if they actually had in their employee a uh, professional engineer. And when they discovered that our company of nine or 10 at that time did not, they opened a full-scale enforcement action against the business wow. because we were misrepresenting us ourselves. We were holding ourselves out as professional engineers when we were not. And that was an imminent risk to the health and safety of the public. And, uh, but they, they, you know, look, they understood how it happened and they were even somewhat amenable to, you know, thinking about things that they could do to help on the fines. But the way the law worked in that day, you know, every day you hold yourself out is another charge. And so the L pages are published for a year. So you're talking about 365 days of this. And it was going to be an awful experience and also very uh, publicly embarrassing for us. And so as I worked with the enforcement officer, <clears throat> I said, look, I think I can get registered because I've got the educational background and can do all of this. And then he laughed and he said, okay, well, that's what we really want. So if, yeah, if you can do that, then fine. And the long story short is it took a while because I still had to attend quarterly board meetings that were dealing with this enforcement action. And so I'm now PE. The reason I say all that is that when we see the FCC coming out with guidance that says we want a professional engineer or a certified engineer in the room, I know what state boards of registration for professional engineers can do if anybody holds themselves out as an engineer to the extent that those state boards have control over the title. So I know that in telecom, people will call themselves telecom engineers all the time. There's kind of a waiver in place for larger companies like AT&T. But if you're a WISP, if you're smaller, you know, you need to be aware of what the state boards in your state can actually do, because I've been on the business end of that before, and that's not pleasant and it's, you know, not great. So I'll, I'll finish that part of the story just by saying this, that, you know, WISPA advocated to not require um, an engineer by title to come up with something else like a certified technology officer, but that would require rulemaking at this point, which we're still uh, considering pursuing uh, because of the way that the language works. But, you know, WISP who are feel like filling out the BDC need, need to be very careful with that. We can argue that public safety is not at risk by someone filling out these submissions, but state boards might see it differently. So a caution for those who have a lot of energy 
about this particular topic. I get it. I understand it. Um, if you're, you're, if you're mad at the FCC, maybe you're mad at WISPA for not, uh, uh, you know, just basically falling on the sword at their, you know, trying to take that hill, that hill, that hill. But uh, be careful because your state boards might be watching. Yeah, that's one of those things you've you've, you've got to be so careful of. You know, I graduated. I was comp E out of tech. That's actually how I knew Mike uh, Molesky, you know, from that sort of stuff back in the day. And they're like, oh, everyone's like, oh, you're an engineer now. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it kind of depends on who you ask. Uh, it's the same reason I didn't sit <laughs> yeah. the tests. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm define like, that. Eh, define that, right? Yeah. On a job, you know, on a on a finance application, sure, right? But, you yeah. know, it's it's one of those things where I don't think people have taken the classification very seriously, and it means very specific things to very specific organizations. So, no, it's a, it's a super important note, and I think it really adds some color to that conversation so people understand, you know, where this is and it's not necessarily something you can just ignore or call yourself. So... On the flip side, Caleb, I actually had professional engineers come to me and ask for me to uh, be much stronger in defending the industry now that I'm a PE, you know, mm. but uh, but I don't think that I'm giving the industry short shrift. You know, the, there's a there, there's a code of ethics that PEs have to live by. And so I'm very mindful of that. Uh, but at the same time, I just don't think that uh, data submission rises to the level of, you know, requiring certification by someone that a state board could associate with a registered engineer. Yeah. I mean, I think we're in agreement too. It's, you know, for, for what's being done, you know, it's not like a, a bridge is going to fall down on somebody's <laughs> head or something like that too. So, well, interesting. So yeah, you know, I think the, the hottest topic of conversation right now uh, across the industry is, you know, the the governmental money that's flowing in and all sort of the, the hooks and stickiness of it. You know, your, your timing into this uh, joining the organization was very um, fortunate if you like to get into those conversations, I would say. So great. But, um, you know, it seems like you've got a lot of really good background and can kind of navigate you know, both the technical side, but also the, I don't know, the paperwork side of thing, the political side, the financial side of thing, which is, it's good for sure. Yeah. The, the good news, I guess, is that I have sort of a personal motto of, of coming to work every day, willing to be surprised. And, you know, <laughs> this is certainly delivered. The NOFO was issued on May 13th. My official start date was June 1st. I was working behind the scenes during May and so that exploded you know, because I was trying to tail off some work. I was doing at broadband um, as well. I was got to juggle all that. It's like, well, hello. <laughs> so, You're like, I don't uh, even have business cards yet, people. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So, yeah, that's, uh, it, it, I came up to speed very, very quickly on that topic. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's definitely a trial by fire scenario. So we've had a couple of conversations uh, in previous podcasts from the BDC side from more of a technical perspective. So uh, with the tower coverage with Dennis Burgess and then yeah, Cameron yeah. Krum. So, you know, we've covered a lot of the... Um, I guess the mechanics behind the BDC. And it seems to be that people are mostly on board with how they're going to get this done. Right. Um, you know, that deadline is looming and I think a lot of progress has been made into getting that done. So I think, I don't know, maybe it'd be good to get some of your insight, not necessarily from the, the, the tech part of this, but maybe the, like, why are we doing this beyond just being annoying and painful and the government always wants to stick his nose into it. Like, I think there's more of a story there that yeah. if we can kind of get the word out, yes, this is a huge pain, but kind of here's where things are going and you know, how WISPA is helping kind of frame that message too, not only to their constituency, but also to the government and maybe find some sort of middle ground or something because, you know, it's, it's easy to say mapping is important. So we, we know where we can close the digital divide or, or however you want to pitch that. Right. Right. But, you know, you've got a lot of good people or a lot of people in there with good intentions. And as you know, it can turn into a real mess. So, you know, if you could kind of speak to the BDC side of thing, the mapping side of thing and how that plays into not just what's happening now with the, the bead stuff, but, you know, where things might be going from the future with this. Well, if we go back not that many years ago, the FCC was pretty much the regulatory agency that we cared about in our industry. Uh, and the FCC, to its credit, has had a lot of time to put in place procedures as time consuming as they can be. You kind of know what to expect. You can petition. You can, you know, basically create a, 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 a proposed rulemaking. You can 
reply to comments or you provide comments and reply. There's a process and there's a cadence at the FCC that's uh, very inclusive at the end of the day on making sure that all voices are heard. And so you can uh, not maybe set your watch by it, but the FCC has got all that down pat. Um, NTIA and the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture's Rural Utility Service, uh, those are relatively recent entrants. Our U.S. has certainly been doing things in rural electrification, for example, for a long time, but telecom has been a little newer for them. And uh, in my experience, anyway, our U.S. has been a little more like the FCC in their approach. They, they have sort of a a rigor that can be overbearing at times in the application process for the funds that they, you know, disperse. You know, they don't want to provide funding to more than one entity in an area, historically at least. Um, and so interesting that that our U.S. has done it that way. And and I mentioned that leading up to NTIA because you know the FCC itself is intended to be bipartisan. You know, it, it'll, it'll have a political leaning based on who is president at any given time. Right now, we have a deadlocked commission because there's the fifth commissioner that, you know, uh, has not yet been seated. So it's 2-2. But in the case of RUS, RUS is Department of Agriculture. And agriculture is a, a political organization at the top, you know, as is Department of Commerce. And so both uh, ag and commerce ultimately, you know, have to work harder to salute the flag of whoever um, is in office at uh, um, at that particular time. And what that means for NTIA, I think, and I want to be careful, I give all of the, the, you know, the qualifications of the caveats up front, nothing I'm saying here is intended to be provocative to any individual or anything like that. I'm trying to come at this <clears throat> apolitically, okay? So feel free to knock me if you sense an agenda in here. But in Washington, the reality is you've got to be able to work across both sides in order to get things done. But NTI really doesn't have the processes in place that FCC has, for example. And they're beginning to develop those because they've been uh, responsible for managing funding programs, going back to BTOP, for example, in the Obama administration and digital set-top boxes before that. And a long time ago, they were certainly known to me for their propagation modeling and RF and the work that they did there. So I like NTIA, but NTIA doesn't have the process of seeking comment, um, acting on it, you know, going through another round again. And so that's how you end up in a situation where you get surprised. Like, you know, where did this um, uh, exclusion of unlicensed spectrum from their definition of reliable broadband service come from when that's not indicated in the uh, Infrastructure Act uh, that basically created the BEAD program, but I digress. Mm -hmm. so, so NTIA doesn't have the same processes in place that say FCC does, but uh, it's clear to me that over the last few presidential administrations, uh, the administrations have looked at their political organizations like Commerce and Ag, and they said, hey, we've got more control over these guys than we do at FCC. So why don't we you know, make sure that the funding goes that way? Now, that's a little flippant on my part, but that's kind of the way it could easily be read. So while in the past, we might have focused all of our efforts or virtual all our efforts on the FCC, now we have to be a lot more aware of NTIA and RUS, you know, Ag. Um, we have to find ways that we can advocate in those organizations, knowing that they're political organizations that involves a lot more work on Capitol Hill, for example. And it's also now exploding up, obviously, because we have state broadband offices that are coming into the mix. And all of these are, you know, kind of different. So I think that what we see in the bead NOFO is we see an effort to try to put together some structure where structure wasn't clearly provided in the Infrastructure Act. And in doing it, uh, they have, for better or for worse, tried to pick winners and losers. Um, they've certainly uh, underscored the preference for fiber. You know, I get that. I understand, you know, why that seems like an easy button. Uh, but some of the other aspects of the NOFO are problematic, especially the smaller operators. And I want to talk about that for a minute. I mean, 
in the what the elephant in the room is unlicensed spectrum, and I know we're going to talk about that, but I want to you know sort of pick on some of the other issues that are there too. You know, for example, um, there's a letter of credit requirement yep. uh, to be a recipient for funding, and I know from having to have, we had to go through that at Broadband VI that uh, letters of credit are not things that you just walk into the bank and ask for. You know, for example, in many cases, if you're willing to get a bank to agree to issue a letter of credit, by the way, not all banks can. So typically you're going to be working with a JP Morgan Chase or something like that. And I'll come back to why that's a problem in a minute. Um, but as you're working through their requirements, they're basically standing behind you and your business. They're willing to take it on the chin completely if you fail to meet the obligations that are associated with the letter of credit, which means that the bank is going to want to over collateralize everything so that there is absolutely no chance that they're ever going to be in a position <clears throat> where they're out any money, that they have some recourse to be able to go get what they need uh, in order to satisfy whatever your obligation was. In many cases, certainly all cases in my experience, they're going to want to collateralize things that are not related to the project that's being funded. So while you're thinking about building a network, maybe with fiber, maybe with fixed wireless, however you're going about doing it, chances are when you go to try to get the letter of credit, they're going to say, no, you can't use those assets to collateralize. Because if you fail, those failed too. So you know we, we can't monetize that. So we need to know where your other assets are. We need to be able to have sufficient collateralization of that in order to make that happen. And I would just observe that the passion that WISPs are throwing into their business, the investments that they're making in their communities, chances are every dollar or almost every dollar of profit they're making, they're using to continue to upgrade the network, to improve services for their customers to you know, deal with you know outages that come from time to time, to do forklift upgrades because we keep jacking up the uh, definition of broadband. Chances are there's not a big pile of hidden money somewhere that uh, is gonna serve as, uh, as collateral. So the letter of credit, we haven't talked much about this yet, um, uh, certainly internally to WISPA, but we've been trying to be very on point in our messaging back to NTIA, but I'm concerned about the uh, letter of credit requirement. And I'm hoping that we can get that shifted to something like a performance bond or you know, maybe set some limits for where the letter of credit kicks in. Because I think that can disqualify many operators, not just WISPs, but you know, small private utilities that are trying to play in the space too. And I don't understand why that was there. There are other things that I find yeah, troubling just because they seem unnecessary. Uh, there, there's the basically requirement to look at labor rate, um, uh, you know, some sort of standard that's set at a federal level. And that's generally not the way uh, rural America works. You know, so uh, that can be very problematic when you're looking at adding expense uh, on the money that's being delivered. Oh, and one thing I will say about the letter of credit, going back to it, the bank's going to charge you basically a fee every year for that. And that can be between three to 5%. So it doesn't take very many years before the bank fees have actually eaten up a significant part of the money that you got in the first place after qualifying for all this. So the letter of credit is expensive. The labor rate aspect is expensive. Um, both require a level of I'd say performance and care that have not been priorities for smaller operators, you know? The, uh, and what I mean by that is that smaller operators are working on managing their business. They're not working on you know, making sure that a financial report is going to their bank on time every single month. You know, that, so they can do that, but that takes time away from other things that they're doing. So if I, uh, would have a general overarching complaint about the bead nofo. It just wasn't designed by people who knew what the rural experience was all about. And so however they came to be here, they've effectively told the first responders, the ones that have gone into these communities before, built these networks when the big guys left or wouldn't go, you know, in, they've said, you know, we really want you to participate in this, but now here's 16 tons of stuff you're going to have to do. And 
addition to everything else you're doing in order to maybe qualify for this. Uh, yeah. I think that could have been thought through better. And I think if they had adopted a procedure kind of like the FCC has to uh, invite comments, they could have gotten a lot more industry um, engagement uh, and advice that would have made it possible for them to get to a successful program sooner. Yeah, definitely. It's 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 incredible how complex this whole process is, you know, and, uh, you know, from the, the, the past uh, podcast that we've done and the more we dig into this and the further we go, it's just it, it really seems like the, the rules have been set for somebody else. And uh, really, it makes it would make some people question, like, do they, you know, even want to go after it? Right. Um, you know, what is the uh, risk to reward ratio of that? And sometimes it seems like, you know, I think if you you know, uh, I, mean, I don't want to say don't go after the money. I mean, if it's there and you can do it and you have uh, the capacity to do it properly, yeah, you should, right? But at the same time, it's like, you know, as as WISP, we've been doing this since day one with no funding whatsoever, right? So I, I keep advocating and telling people, it's like, if you can go for it, that's fine. That's great. It's there. Why not? But at the same time, it's like, just keep doing what you've been doing. If you build a network, that's reliable, right? And you're offering speeds that are more than usable and sufficient for people to live their lives in the digital world today. Not everybody needs gigabit, you know? I mean, I'm a techie and, I, you know, I don't use anywhere near what, you know, is offered to me. I have like a 200 meg cable connection at home. At best, I only get 50 out of it, you know? Yeah, if, right, yeah. Yeah, I do my speed tests, right? So even the big yeah. guys with yeah. multi-billion dollar companies aren't delivering the speeds that they're charging me for. And I, and I use just a fraction of that. So I I think that if we we take a smart approach and like I said, not I'm, I'm, I'm really big on kind of keeping everybody positive. You know, a lot of people were really worried about Starlink. Well, look what just happened with their funding. You know what I mean? It's like keep your eye on the prize. The worst thing you could do is to stop what you're doing you know, follow that rabbit down the rabbit hole of this money that it's there and, and stop progressing the way you have been. Because if you build a good network and your coverage, whether it's considered served or unserved because it's licensed or unlicensed, whatever that may be, people are going to consider, hey, you know, do we want to go into this area? Do we want to overbuild it? Because it seems like everybody's happy there. So it's, it's uh, there, there's a lot to navigate here and a lot of decisions that have to be made on what's really the right approach. You know, there's protections that you have to look at. We haven't talked about now CBRS is finally being considered licensed or served now, which is something really important. Maybe there are some protection mechanisms that WISPs can do on a smaller budget to at least consider their area served. So therefore the money doesn't pour into them and, and, and try to wipe them out. So there's there's a lot of things to discuss here and it just gets more and more complicated and more and more in depth as we talk about it. There's a program in the Virgin Islands, uh, and I, I want to be careful here because I am using this as an example and not as a target. Okay, but I think you would, uh, 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 listeners or viewers would be able to identify something similar in their own community. Uh, the opportunity for federal funds <clears throat> inspired many people in the Virgin Islands to go press very hard for uh, reconnect money, for example, uh, any kind of money that would be available because. The entire territory was unserved, that was the argument. And if you were in Washington, D.C., you wouldn't know any better. You look at the demographics of the Virgin Islands, certainly the socioeconomic uh, you know, side of it, you'd think, well, yeah, of course, there's nothing going on you know, there towards you know, broadband. But the reality is there were two principal carriers competing with each other, and there were two or three other smaller WISPs. So there was a total of easily five, six, seven ISPs that were active in the Virgin Islands and uh, the territory is completely served, completely served for those who are arguing at the at my face and the screen right now, it completely served. And so uh, in the case of uh, uh, the Reconnect program or others that came in, they were shocked to learn that this was in fact the case. Um, and yes, we didn't have gigabit fiber going to every you know, residents, I'm going to come back to speed tests in a minute. But the reality is it was completely served. It was covered. Uh, so what I like about the mapping exercise, at least from a high level, is that what they're trying to do is to say, OK, look, we have too many agencies that are running. The FCC, NTI, RUS, you've got the federal programs that 
occasionally make money available in black grants. You have the state stuff. We need one source of truth on what's going on. Is the area served or not? So the notion of coming up with sort of consistent image of what is and isn't served kind of settles all those arguments, right? I know it's a pain in the rear to go through because people are concerned about you know, exposing elements of their network to, comp to competitors, or they're concerned about what's the government going to do with this information. And those are all valid concerns. But at the same time, if you don't have a database that is showing something clearly about how to mesh all these programs and identify what's served or not, then all you're going to do is get continuing government waste where you're going to get overbuilt anyway. It's just going to happen. It's the way it is. So having a, a database, a mapping database that eventually will get right, I think is a good thing. Right now, it's having big, you know, teething pains, you know, as we're going through this and discovering some of the issues that are there and certainly the definitions of what can be included and what can. Going back to speed tests for a minute, I don't know about you guys, but I've looked at various networks I've been a part of just to sort of see what we're consuming in the backhaul. Yep. Not what we're uh, pushing to customer premise, but actual utilization in our backhaul links. And on a per capita basis, per subscriber basis, even recently, it's been on the order of two and a half to five megabits per second. Okay. All right. Something like that. So when people are out there saying, no, we have to have gigabit to our homes. No, you don't. And for an <laughs> iOS download, that's nice because to extent your iPhone or your iPads cooperating, you can get it downloaded very quickly, but you're not using gigabit. Zoom calls are somewhere around five megabits per second. You know, how many of those can you fit in a 50 meg connection? You know, gaming even, and the, the latency, we can talk about all the other aspects. For Don't get me started. Service get me started. But, but the point is, is that you're not using a gig. Now, I know I sound like a dinosaur in saying that because, well, certainly, <laughs> David, we're going to have a need for a gig in the future. Yeah, if you're going to invent a transporter or something like that and make it possible for you to beam you know, yourself across the country, perhaps. But I'm having a hard time seeing why uh, delivery of a gig end to end perfectly in a network is happening anytime soon. I certainly understand why we want to raise the bar so that we can you know, have networks that are going to be capable of delivering what's coming at us in the future. But at the same time, if you're looking at it now, <laughs> look at just measure the networks. Go to Spectrum, go to at t look at what they're actually doing in their own backhauls, and they're not doing a gig anywhere. Yeah. You're getting me excited. You're getting me fired up. It's just, I knew this was going to be a great call. And <laughs> one thing that I one thing that I really like uh, about these podcasts is it's really not about you know Caleb or myself. It's about the guest. And uh, you know we we do a lot on social media. And 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 you can't read a person or know a person uh, by what they post uh, on Facebook and stuff like that on social media. It's you you have to see that person. You have to hear that person. Is it? I have to look at your facial expressions, your body posture, and all that stuff. And that's how you can see true passion right yeah. and and it's clear that your passion is there uh with you know the majority i think of wisps too like we said i mean this 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 is something that i that i always talk about i i really don't even like the model that isps have for selling speed i i think we should just that's the that's the dinosaur in the room not us we've been around a while we're not the dinosaurs that's the model that's a dinosaur it's about reliability it's about offering of course more bandwidth than they would need but if you can deliver a, a reliable connection um, that's there when you need it Yes, it has to be quick. It has to be somewhat of an instant. When you click on something, the page opens up. We're not scrolling down like in the old days, building right. a page, right? So speed's important, but I really don't think that the public really understands and they need to be educated. The consumers here need to be educated on what good internet really means. And these definitions that are currently out there, which are just loosely thrown about uh, really i think is what needs to be defined and that's what we need to do we need to educate the customer base into what's you know what's good and what's not you know it can be a hard thing uh, to define using analogies i'm going to try so that you know you can perhaps give me some guidance on how i can improve this but let's just talk about your bathtub for a minute if you're going to go decide that by God, today is the day I'm going to go take a bath. I've got my Epsom salts or whatever it is I'm going to put in there. 
when you turn the water on in your mind, you're thinking I probably have five minutes to go kind of get ready for my bath. Well, if you had gigabit water delivery, your bathtub would be filled up in a microsecond. How does that help your bath experience? Are you still okay with a five minute filling of your bathtub or do you need it like that? Because right now I'm ready for my bath. Um, when you think about power coming into your house, most homes have 150 uh, or 200 amp risers coming in you know, to their homes. Uh, but you know, if we're gonna have gigabit power, then uh, I think what we need to do is we need to get those big honking power lines you know, that are carrying 100,000 you know, bolts or whatever, you know, right up in our backyard because I need to make sure that if I need it, when I need it, it's absolutely going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, you know, that party that we're going to throw next week, we're going to need to really scale up the size of our sewer because the stuff that we're serving is probably going to provoke some stuff. So I don't just want the sewer line that comes on the residential side. I want the utility yeah. sewer line to go in there because that's what I need. And listen, while we're at it, uh, you know, um, I, although I don't really want to drive down my driveway at 80 miles an hour, I think I need to improve the driveway to interstate highway standards, probably put in four lanes on each side, just in case, you know, so that I can get in and out of my driveway at highway speeds. It's like every other circumstance where we look at utilities and how they're traffic engineered, you, you basically engineer a power network to deliver what is needed to a high degree of high quality service most of the time with rare exceptions. And so most people don't even think to your point about speed, they don't think about power. Is my air conditioning running? Is the refrigerator running? Is my house cool? I kind of run all my appliances. If I can do that, I'm fine. I'm not thinking about my water main. I'm not thinking about my sewer line. I'm not thinking about anything else that's related to uh, sort of a utility traffic managed um, uh, system. But with internet, we've gotten fascinated with, oh, we gotta have a gig, gotta have a gig. And uh, and I think part of that's been skillful marketing on the part of people who are pushing. Yep. Uh, and I think, you know, it's uh, probably here to stay. It's gonna be hard for us to argue with that, except through looking at the reality that people aren't using a gig, they're not. Well said, great analogies. Yeah, you know, the quality aspect of it too, I think plays really heavily in. It's, it's such a difficult thing to sort of measure and test though, you know, cause you know, down in my parents' house, rural Georgia, middle BFE nowhere. And you're like, yeah, they've got good Verizon LTE coverage. They got plenty of speed down there on a map somewhere. Cause they're, you know, three miles from a tower or whatever, but you know, they're covered according to the the specs and stuff like that. But if mom wants to send me a text message or a picture, like she has to go on the porch, go stand in the right <laughs> corner, like that sort of thing too. Like there's no real consideration for quality or, I mean, my 200 meg pipe right now I've got from uh, spectrum. Yeah. It's 20% packet loss for the last two weeks. Right. So yeah. It's, yeah. I'm basically piggybacking yeah. on my phone connection right now. So, you know, I think people don't understand the quality aspect of it. Like it's for someone who's uneducated to the tech, a number is an easy binary sort of thing. Right. right. Cause they're like, right. you know, some politician somewhere is like, well, what's good? 100. Okay. hundred's a nice round number. My brain can wrap around, you know? So I think that's where a lot that comes from and is really, you know, difficult to push the concept of a quality connection just versus a straight sort of speed limit connection. So that's, that's always going to be the tough part in this fight, especially when those pushing that, you know, good intentions and stuff, but there's a lot of, you know, touchy feely unicorn rainbow feel good stuff that plays into it. So it was really easy to be like big number. We'll get everybody the big number and then everyone's happy. And it's not how it really works in the real world. Exactly. Exactly. It's all it's all marketing, and it's it's uh, how easily it's digestible. It's like you know, like you said, you know, offering a hundred meg package, and well, we're not going to offer one gig. We're going to offer you a thousand megs, right? Because you know, the average person is like, well, a thousand is more than a hundred, so that must be better, <laughs> right? You know, and that's the way it, that's the way it works. But don't get me started on five G. You start talking about seven. Oh God, no, no. <laughs> so, nah. so quick, go on, go on to the next ne next next topic before well, I go on my five G rant. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Version seven. So, so going back to the, the BDC and mapping, I mean, we know right now it's 
pretty much a cluster, right? Like, yeah. I mean, we don't have a standardized address system across the entire country, you know, nationally 911 database and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it's going to be a minute before that gets to a usable phase, but, you know, staying positive at the same time too. I mean, do you have any sort of feeling where, you know, how long it's going to take the BDC mapping system to be, relatively realistic are the big guys going to come in and just blow it up because they're like the the map shows pink here so we're covering this whole you know state or something like that you know i'm really curious how the big guy data flowing into this is really going to have the effect you know further than the view that we've got into the the wis trying to put their stuff in we have an advisor who works for wisp i'm going to get his uh his quote wrong here. <clears throat> He's actually Steve Coran. He's an attorney who works in the industry. And, uh, and he describes the BDC process as we are basically designing a database uh, without a plan, blindfolded, um, and with, uh, you know, bad data. So uh, now he, he, I've completely skewered, you know, his quote's a lot funnier than mine was, but he, uh, <laughs> His point is, you know, the FCC in particular knows that this is going to take a few rounds in order to get right. And so we know we're going to be better eventually. The real question, though, is, you know, what happens in this period of time when we're getting it wrong? Because if we have people submitting BDC submissions and if they are subject to some punitive action because they got something wrong, that's going to discourage participation and sort of amp up the the, uh, the volume of complaints, you know, that would be a problem. And if funding decisions are made based on bad data, you're still going to let um, some money go uh, towards overbuilding existing served areas that were avoidable. You know, the, the, the rush to make sure that we close the digital divide uh, sort of means that we're going to trample over some of the opportunities while we work the bugs out. And so that's going to be very aggravating. There's the scene in the uh, Hunt for Red October where uh, the Soviet Navy is trying to chase and they're just pinging away, but they're not listening. And what they're really trying to do is just drive the Red October, right? If you remember that scene at all. And so right now we've got a bunch of pinging that's happening and I'm not sure that we have enough listening. And I don't think that that's going to be, you know, effective immediately. Hopefully in the long term, it will. I do have confidence that we're going to end up with a mapping program that works. But you're right. You know, there's no standard standardized addressing. You know, what is a location? Who decided that? How do you argue that process? How do you appeal? Uh, and even within, uh, you know, <clears throat> coverage mapping itself, working with some of the tools that are out there and seeing what's there, uh, some of the tools will differentiate <clears throat> between where you're providing you know, 100 megabit service versus where you're capable of providing 25. And what that can do is open up holes within your coverage area that are unserved. <clears throat> you know, so what are you submitting here? Are you saying that your entire area is going to be underserved because you're going to the least common denominator? Or are you going to try to create this patchwork where it looks like Swiss cheese? You know, well, I'm served over here, but not you know, a mile away. Uh, it's, it's so there are you know, things like that that can be, I think, really maddening and troubling. There's a lot of tolerance stacking going on, right? Because you're like, all right, address data, okay, little fuzzy. Uh, LIDAR data for coverage, all right, little fuzzy. Propagation map, all right, little fuzzy. But you put all these things together and you can have so much slop where you've got an end result. You know, you're like, all right, well, this, this kind of works. Or you've got so much tolerance slop across the board that you end up with something that's not even remotely realistic. So. Uh, but it is an iterative process, you know, and obviously it's better than what we've ever had before, which was, you know, effectively nothing. So we've got some, uh, you know, some history here, some precedent, uh, but I don't think it's being applied in this particular case. And in the, in the sailor industry, uh, as it was getting going, there was a requirement that sailor operators build out <clears throat> to provide coverage to, I think, a certain geographic area, a portion of the geographic area and their service area and a certain portion of their population within a certain period of time. So I think it was like 95% of the population and 90% of the area within some period of time is what they had to be able to build out and prove. 
Now, I know that is you're designing and installing a network in that particular case, but you know, I think that that's something that mapping could look at as well. You know, within whatever you're defining as your service area or whatever they want to define as a service area, are you providing service to 95% of the population, 90% of the area, you know, something like that, rather than end up with something that is so granular that it uh, it is hard to analyze. Just an idea. Yeah, I mean... You know, we see it with we saw it with the DSL build out stuff too. Like, at least those those companies like they understand what it takes to get the service coverage. They can define that. Like, I was I was co oping with Bell South uh, ninety nine two thousand when they were trying to get back in the long distance game, and the feds were like, "All right, you can do it, but you've got to put DSL. You know, cover I forget what the numbers were. Cover some percentage of the population with DSL coverage." And like, sure, and they knew exactly. You know, they were drop. We were dropping D slams in every building that had more than one floor across Northeast Atlanta. Yep. Like, you know, they knew exactly what it was going to take to just match the absolute bare minimum letter wow. of the law. Now, of course, that all collapsed. You know, immediately after nine eleven and everything like that. But you know. There's there's some aspect of like getting it good enough as much as you hate to say that like you know there's a target goal can be acquired here but we're also now mixing in you know not just a data set from a hardline provider cable provider cellular provider but you know these regional telcos we got electric calls we got everybody sticking their data into this big bowl and be like hey this is going to be a great stew well <laughs> there's you know someone might drop something in there that's a little dirty so it's just it's going to be an interesting yeah, right. iterative <laughs> process so Somebody's going to turn the punch bowl. So, but, uh, so kind of, kind of shifting away from that a little bit. One of the things I don't think has really been discussed very much is the state level aspect of what this plays into, right? Cause right now everyone's focuses on the fed, you know, big, bad fed, but you know, a lot of this money and a lot of the administrative stuff is going to be handled down at the state level, which, you know, some people are federalist, some people are, you know, very much state. I think it's good at the state level, my personal opinion, because every state's different, right? Like how you want to run a, a, a network or a build out in Vermont versus Mississippi versus California are completely different affairs, right? But now I forget what's the number. Like right now there's only like 26 states or something like that with broadband offices. I don't remember the number exactly, but I don't have the current count, but I know that all 50 won in on the program. So oh, yeah. they're, they're yeah, going to catch up. Definitely. Yeah. yeah everybody's <laughs> got their hand out, but so I think it was 26, 20, I don't know, something like, roughly half. Right. So, you know, your, your Californias and stuff have well-established programs and political processes and stuff, but but a lot of places don't. And, you know, when you start worrying about waste or grift or, you know, whatever that may be, you know, when now we're talking about 50 little fiefdoms trying to, to argue about what it is, you know, to me, that's really the concerning part is there's just 50 different ways of doing business, which is good because it allows for flexibility for given that. And it gives, you know, if you're a regional operator, you know, you've got access to people at the, the county and state level way more than you would at the federal level. So I think there's a ton of potential there, but yep. there's also definitely, I think, that chaos factor that might even, you know, they're everyone's getting worried about getting overbuilt now. Right. But I mean, realistically, we're not talking about money hitting out till late 23, 24, yeah. whatever that may be. All these offices have to get going. And then what happens at the end of 24? And let's say we've got a, a, a national political pivot, right? So somebody's side wins or vice versa. And then now, you know, do we continue on or does this all this sort of shift over? So, you know, I think going back to Tassos's point, you know, those that are afraid of getting overbuilt today or tomorrow, I mean, realistically, you've got a lot of runway here. So it's definitely not doom and gloom. But at the same time, you know, obviously don't ignore it. So... Uh, the the state the state part of this is I think what's going to be really interesting and really those that are interested you know there's your opportunity to kind of get in on this and and learn what it is. So there's several things to kind of unpack in that. You know, first I was talking earlier about my experience in public, private, and academic partnerships, and uh, ultimately in those sorts of partnerships, you're going to have some clash of priority, and so. <laughs> ideally you play to your own strengths and that's how you create something that can last. But <clears throat> I think the term public private partnership is thrown around too much kind of glibly. 
And it actually requires a hell of a lot of work to make those work. People come in thinking they're 50-50 relationships. They're not. They're 100-100, kind of like a marriage. You know, it just, you, you can't you, you can't downshift at all, but you're dealing with another party that has a different perspective on the world than you do. So in states that tend to sort of favor uh, government intervention or government control, government involvement, then uh, the state's going to want to have a lot more to say about how you run your network, how you spend, you know, how you potentially hire, you know, things of this sort. And other states that are more relaxed, perhaps, about government involvement may have a stronger private uh, sector um, side or character of what's going on. And because every state is different, um, I'm fine with that. You know, I think that it's better to have a 50 um, state program than a one size fits all. Well, then we'll spend some other remarks that I've made publicly before. Another little story for you guys. There's a guy who, uh, he was a union uh, officer uh, in the Civil War. Uh, he lost an arm in that battle, and he ended up as the first sort of notable head of the U.S. Geological Survey. His name is John Wesley Powell. And uh, he was tasked with going and looking at what was happening out in the western United States, the territories, to figure out how those areas can be developed. And uh, so he went and he looked and he realized very quickly a couple of things. You know, first of all, there were all sorts of Aboriginal cultures there that had to be uh, addressed. But most importantly to him, he knew instantly that you could not take a township mentality that pervaded the East Coast, you know, the Delawares, and make it work in Montana. You couldn't take a tract of land and say, we're going to divide it this way. We got Main Street here and we've got Oak Street or Elm Street or whatever to do this. The church goes there. There's the city. You can't do that. And the reason for that is, is that water is scarce in uh, the Western U.S. And so he came back and really beat the drum in Congress for shifting the way development in the West was going to be sort of attacked. Nobody listened to him because they kind of liked their township mentality. And so they tried that out there. And I just saw uh, the story uh, yesterday or this morning about how the states uh, are still fighting over what to do about the Colorado River while Lake Mead continues to go down. You know, these water rights stories have been going on for a long time. The point to this is that over 100 years ago, we actually had the head of somebody um, uh, of an organization, USGS, trying to tell the federal government, let the states decide or shift the design priorities so that it deals with the realities that exist on the ground in these territories or in these states. But state, uh, the feds were not, no, we're not doing that. We do it this way. So I think on the one hand, NTI should be congratulated because they got a little bit of John Wesley Powell's message right. I, don't, I think it was inadvertent, but they did. <laughs> it's like, let the states decide. But at the same time, they came at this with a uh, township mentality. You know, it's all going to be fiber and it's all going to be, you know, letter credit and all the other stuff that's in there. It's like, no, you really, <laughs> you had an opportunity to get it 100% right. And, you know, I'm giving them a little grief for this, but they've got good friends there. And so, you know, I know that they've had their hands full trying to get uh, this thing out the door. But PAL is an inspiration to this process, too, because I think if we can all go look at the Texases and the Montanas and even the Indianas um, and uh, not try to treat them like New York or Vermont, to your point earlier, we're going to be OK. And I think where WISPs have an advantage if they'll play the card is that they're the ones who are already on the ground there. They're the ones who are already serving in these communities and they might not have spent much time in their state houses. But they're the ones who have customers who will vouch for them, who are they're established in their communities. They have the relationships, probably with a local bank. You know, people know where to find them. Uh, if they were producing net promoter score kind of KPIs in their business, they would be way out in front of anything that the traditional fiber or cable guys are doing. They got some cards to play. Yeah, but. Yeah. Um, I think one of the uh, things that I would deliver as a message to WISPs is that COVID uh, took us by surprise in the sense that prior to COVID, I think all internet service was sort of considered best efforts, you know, including in the WISP community, but certainly including in any other wired uh, 
But now people have come to see it as absolutely required. I've got telemedicine appointments for my kids going to school this way, or I'm working remotely and I have to be on these calls. I can't um, stomach the possibility that it's down or it went down because it was convenient for you to do something right at this moment. And so there's <clears throat> there are some disciplines that I think WISPs can begin to apply to the extent they're not already doing it based on the realization that we flipped, you know, nobody's fault, but it happened. We went from best efforts to where now it's required to be a very high degree of service quality. Definitely. Yep. A hundred percent on that. So, you know, and, and that's something I mean, we've talked about, I mean, since we started doing the podcast, it's over like and over, again. over and over and it's, yeah, the, the competition, like there's always going to be competition. It was what was dooming like a year ago. The dooming gloom was what Starlink, right? Starlink was going to put the entire Wisp industry yep. out of business yep. and Hey, look, we're all still here, but it is. Yep. Yeah. 5g is going to put the whole Wisp industry out of business. But you know, at the same time, there's definitely to your point, the, the days of being able to run just a few megs and stuff like that. And kind of taking a lackadaisical approach, you know, I was, is probably pulling back significantly for sure. So, you know, you've got to think about the networks that you're building, the investment, the technology type, and, you know, do think a bit more longer term about where you're going with things. Yep. And that's, you've seen that, you've seen that change also in, in the, like say the hardware that's available, right? So there, yeah. there was a point, like you said, definitely it was way before COVID, right? But it was kind of the race to the bottom. It was like, I needed the cheapest CPE. I needed the cheapest access point because all I had to do was deliver service to somebody because it wasn't as important. And now we're starting to see a shift where they're like, I'm not going to buy, you know, this antenna or this radio because it's the cheapest. I, I want the best. So you're seeing radios change from plastic enclosures to metal enclosures to be more robust. It's not just about speed, but it's about the reliability and the longevity of, of the hardware, the the you know, the the company philosophy, right, of uh, <clears throat> of a hardware provider is now very important for the migration path right i mean the forklifting sucks nobody wants to do that so yeah. they're looking at uh, and choosing their companies based on will it interoperate with my previous generation so at least i can kind of upgrade the infrastructure and slowly bring those customers over to the newer technology without having to just you know trash it all and restart so so yeah that that mentality and, and that shift it definitely happened and was starting to happen right right before covid but it definitely went into a uh, full 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 throttle mode uh once covid hit and and it became that important for everybody i know that we are looking for stability you know because you, you can buy equipment and you can buy a backhaul that's capable of delivering bandwidth at a certain level. But when the uh, end, end customer delivery standards keep going up, then you may not have the right equipment in your network. And that can be a very expensive process to go and do. So if, <clears throat> if I could express one area of absolute solidarity with WISPs, large and small, it is that, look, I get it, this sort of changing fabric of requirements and uh, uh, and standards where we're setting the bar has a dramatic impact on your business and you need wherever possible for there to be some stability. I did want to uh, shift back to NTIA for a minute because we haven't really talked about, you know, the elephant in the room, but um, we have had meetings with NTIA with the staff to uh, challenge, you know, the notion that unlicensed spectrum somehow doesn't belong in uh, their definition of reliable broadband. And paraphrasing heavily here, but what they said at the staff level is, of course, unlicensed spectrum is reliable. Little r reliable. <laughs> you know, it it probably would have been better if they could have uh, come up with a terminology instead of capital R reliable broadband service. If they had done something like qualified broadband service to qualify for the Bead funding, they were going to accept or prioritize certain technologies. But what they did by using capital R is they got everybody up in arms about what do you mean? Uh, you know, unlicensed isn't reliable. Yeah, it's reliable. And they acknowledged that little, you know, lowercase r. Uh, but their main concern that they have shared with us is availability. And they're looking over a long period of time, 10 years or so maybe longer for the life of the equipment that's being put in place. Um, will there be available unlicensed spectrum to meet the needs of the future? 
And you can look at that a bunch of different ways. They didn't clarify it in that meeting. Do they think that unlicensed spectrum is suddenly going to change in the future? Maybe FCC policy is going to change on unlicensed, unlicensed. Or is it really more about just the potential for congestion? Because unlicensed means that, you know, anybody can potentially come in. So we're still look, working with NTIA to get clarification on that. You pointed out that CBRS GAA um, is now considered licensed. That was really through the efforts of WISPA. And uh, I would con congratulate Louis Peretz, who is our VP of uh, policy, who's been working you know, hard on that. He was not alone in doing it, but he <clears throat> was the one who was able to point out to the FCC that their precedent uh, on CBRS in particular made it clear that it was intended to be licensed. And so they uh, reverted back to follow their own precedent in the case. But the uh, anyway, so the uh, the question at the NTIA isn't about whether it's lowercase reliable. It's about what to include in their qualified, you know, network solutions, which raises the question for me: What is DSL doing in there? You know, if you're going to talk about availability. <clears throat> does anybody really believe? Yeah, the DSL has got to be around. You know, is, is there some technological improvement coming that I don't know about where, you know, you just replace the uh, stuff in the central office and it's your customer premise and now you've got broadband speeds? I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, all those 40, 40 year old copper lines on, our, on the poles are just going to get magically replaced somehow. And yeah, uh, there are a couple of other things that I would share. Uh, we have gotten a qual qualification as well, a clarification that <clears throat> when they're talking about unlicensed spectrum, they're talking about as it's delivered to the end user. So they know that many of our uh, uh, WISP are using license spectrum in their backhaul. Uh, but this uh, then leads to the question of, okay, so uh, they've left open the door for using a hybrid of licensed and unlicensed spectrum for end user delivery. And we all know that there are systems in place that will do that for backhaul links, but there's not a whole lot in place that does it at the CPE level. So there are some things that we're looking at there because you may be able to use, for example, the dual uh, WAN router at the CPE that uses the unlicensed spectrum as your main connection and maybe throws it over to something that would be considered uh, a, uh, a fixed uh, service that would qualify. Um, uh, and I don't, I, I don't have a magic bullet here. But these are some of the things that we're working with our industry partners on to identify. But if there's one thing that I would say to WISP today, it's that to the extent that you can be looking at GAA as uh, the opportunity, you don't have to deploy it everywhere. Uh, the requirements are that if you get a request that you are able to deploy it within 10 business days, as I recall. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's not a forklift upgrade to your entire network, but it's something that you really should consider uh, as a way of sort of creating uh, some boundaries around the area that you intend to demonstrate is served. And always, you're going to want a better advisor than me on these subjects. So uh, I don't really want to hear later that, well, David said, and, you know, <laughs> that I suddenly become the certifying engineer for your network. Uh, <laughs> it's probably not a good idea. Uh, but, uh, uh, but the finer point is that I do think that we have some time I might get some noise um, uh, from people about this because this is a, it, it can be an existential threat the way that this is shaping up. But the reality is it's going to be uh, it's going to require a lot of time for the money to flow. Um, we do see political change afoot. I don't think it's just 24. We'll see what happens to the Congress. Yeah, the program won't change, but the congressional pressure will to the extent that we see a change in the House and in the Senate. Um, and so uh, this is a work in progress. It's gonna take a while. We've got at least another year of mapping improvements that are underway with waivers associated with that. And so while, yeah, I do believe that some of the areas WISPs are serving would be juicy targets for people, uh, larger operators to come in and use bead money to help build. I think Caleb, you made the point earlier if you're already serving that market well, that's not a guaranteed pickup in customers just because somebody dropped in, you know, with a fiber connection. Yeah. Uh, and the final point I guess I'd make is that I don't think the money is enough. As big as 42 plus billion dollars is, 
when you start imagining how that's going to be deployed in you know fiber infrastructure that's going to be expensive that has supply chain problems by the way i love fiber this is not a uh, being i've used fiber this is not that but if you just look at the practical realities that fiber is going to face if we're really serious about closing the digital divide and going into unserved areas throwing fiber <clears throat> at areas that are partially served, underserved, or even fully served does not close the digital divide at all. Definitely not. Yeah, I mean, so much of this, I mean, it's technically feasible, but you're, you're almost in that infinite money glitch to do so, you know? I've been I've been a lot of places doing a lot of this sort of stuff where I'm like, there's barely roads here. Like, I can barely get the truck to where these people are. There's no way we're getting, you know, the stuff drug up here so yeah and there's there's time to deploy right i mean so yeah you can do fiber everywhere if you want everybody to finally have internet in the next 50 years right where we can get them really good internet wirelessly now right so uh you know supply chain issues is one thing but there's also issues with manpower as well to do it because it's very labor intensive to put fiber in the ground and that's just the backhauls, let's say, right, uh, to, to run the main arteries, then you got to also trench it and do things to get it to the premise as well. So, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's difficult. You know, one more observation I make about this is that I think we can get ourselves into trouble if we look at the stated purpose of the program and believe that that, in fact, is the stated purpose of the program. If, if, if for example, we were serious about closing the digital divide right now, the most agile way to do that without question is wireless. 100%. Absolutely. You know, so if we were serious about doing it, there would be a wireless uh, preference because that can happen tomorrow. You're not trenching roads. You're not getting pole attachment rights or putting up poles. You're not doing any of that. And in particular, unlicensed spectrum, because you can put that up now. That's not something that requires coordination to go and yep. do. Yeah. So if we wanted to solve the problem, if DC wanted to solve the problem, it would have been wireless. So we're not trying to solve the digital divide problem right away, are we? What we're trying to do instead is look at this as a public works project, maybe an FDR era uh, investment so that we can have the billboard that says, we as a nation committed to go and do this and we were gonna do this in a way that was very robust. I mean, that's fine advertise it that way you know yeah, it, it, this is something that is so important at a national level that we're going to go do it this way and yeah you're going to be waiting five years or something to close the digital divide but we're we're on it you know so yeah so by excluding unlicensed spectrum that kind of forces the supply chain and the timelines to align if you think about it it's going to take you time to get fiber it's going to take you time to get a coordinated path it's going to take you time to get facilities on which to put tower, uh, put, put fiber, or to put your uh, paths in place to go do it. Unlicensed, that is not the problem there. So if unlicensed had been included in capital R, reliable broadband service, I think everybody would have run there. Yep. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well said. And I always thought it was funny too. So they can they can basically have a level of granular detail to like have the bean counters like looking at every orifice, making sure your financials are straight. Weird labor laws you've got to do. I'm sure there's going to be some sort of goofy EPA regulations, like all that sort of government like lay on this stuff. Super fine detail. They're going to be watching you. And then on the other hand, they're like, eh, we're just going to negate this giant chunk of technology because you know because we we can't be bothered to look at that in any detail. We can make sure that you're using the right kind of gas can and you're hiring the right kind of person at the like labor rate to carry that gas can to fill up your your trucks but on the other hand we we can't be bothered to look at your entire technology to hype or deployment scale or anything like that it's a little uh backwards to me but uh, who knows government but government now, that said, with the government, I think this is a really good opportunity to uh, kind of tell people, hey, you know, this was doing a lot at the state level, and I think we're seeing a lot more ramp up, you know, trying to get the state level WISPA things rolling, if you'd like to speak to that. We do. We have a state coordinator, coordinator Steve Schwerbel. We have one of our board committees that's working on state programs. We are ramping up our state advocacy uh, program, and that may seem at times to be a little less visible to our members. 
because every state is going to be different and they're operating under different timelines. And so one of the things we're doing uh, also is we're looking at how other organizations, associations, not just in our industry, but elsewhere, have dealt with state level advocacy, because we want to make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel when it comes to tackling these problems. We'll say this, I think that it's likely in most states that what the governor wants is going to be reflected in the state broadband office uh, and in the way these programs are administered. So the governor may even be more important uh, than the legislatures are uh, in the overall scheme of things when it comes to looking at what broadband offices are doing. I mentioned that not to say that we're only working with governors, but just to say to our WISPA members and other WISPs that if you're looking to get involved in advocacy on your own, be thinking about the way your state is actually going to be you know, working. You might be uh, establishing the relationship with the broadband office, but be aware of who is the person who's driving those priorities. Chances are it's your governor. Yeah, and understanding the sort of approach and political stance and everything really plays into it, you know, for the long term, for sure, for sure. So if your governor happens to not be aligned to your political views, you might want to think about your Facebook posts uh, if you're <laughs> going to go, um, uh, you know, try to uh, create a relationship there. That's not advice. It's just an observation. Uh, you want to make sure that when you're uh, trying to get your point across that you are putting your best foot forward. Yep. For sure. For sure. And like a lot of people are like, you know, it's, it's unattainable, but you know, we went to the, the Texas WISPA event last year and I was like, Hey, there's representative people here from the real Texas, you know, state level government. Like it's not unattainable by any stretch of the imagination. Right, so, right. you know, it takes effort. It takes organization, you know, and those sort of, a uh, uh, a skill, you know, soft skills sometimes to, to navigate that scenario, but you know, it's not unattainable. So and in many cases, Caleb, the, the state officials are very thinly staffed, you know. So, for example, in Andy, Indianapolis, a couple of weeks ago, we had the Midwest, Midwest Regional uh, Gathering. We had uh, the Indiana broadband official, you know, came in and he's a staff of two uh, mm -hmm. trying to administer all of this. So they're coming up to speed. The chances are your state will see the same thing. They're coming up to speed and they're trying to develop relationships. And uh, in, in many cases, I believe that they're looking for advice from you. So yeah. make sure that you're known to them and, and take the time to uh, help them understand what you're doing, how long you've been there and how you're making a difference in the community. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Uh, I, I believe, uh, like you said, there's huge opportunity there for uh, WISPs in their local communities at the state level or county level uh, to be the expert and to be the guidance, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, these 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 offices. They're looking for that and uh, they're they're very accepting of that. So it's a real good opportunity for them to get involved, know who the players are and try and inject yourself into that conversation and that uh, decision making process and and help as much as you can. You know, definitely their guard isn't as much too. And you're wearing a, you know, you're, you're from a, a local community and you're not walking in there with like yeah. an AT&T shirt on. Right. So Absolutely. you can have you like know, real you know constituency. You're one of them. Right. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of clout and that goes back to the whole servicing and stuff like that. You know, your community knows who you are, right. They don't know who AT&T is. And I think just society is changing as a whole too. You know, they're, they're tired of the robotic, put you in a box. If you didn't read the fine print, you know, you're going to get screwed kind of attitude right. of big business, right? So, I mean, there's uh, small wisps have such an advantage. I just don't think that they've been, you know, shown what that advantage really is. And, and being local really speaks volumes and empowers you more than you would think. Well, if you, uh, and you may have seen it, but <clears throat> I'll do road trips and I'll uh, just stop off at our members at random and do a little 30 second. Uh, you know, snippets after meeting them and talking, you know, for a while. And the story that oftentimes comes out of this is that these people have been in their communities for a long time. They may have grown their business up with the uh, uh, a, a situation where the uh, existing carrier left. And so somebody's desperate, you know, for service. The point is, is that the support for those WISPs by the community is very intense. Mm -hmm. And so it, the, the WISPs have a constituency, too. And so a broadband official or a governor 
or whoever is administering the program is going to care about where the constituencies are. And so if they're going to uh, promote a program that could disadvantage a beloved uh, member of the community that has made a difference there and that has a constituency all of its own, they may think twice about uh, bringing in a big guy to go over build in those circumstances. So WISPs have some pretty powerful cards to play at the local level. Great. Yep. For sure. For sure. So I guess speaking to kind of the, the public side of WISPA, or I guess where you're going to see the, the next big thing coming up from the public side, I guess is WISPA Palooza. You know, that's what, yes. six, yeah. seven weeks away. So it is <laughs> yeah. coming, that is coming down a tunnel real Get quick. Ready. We were, we were planning all the stuff. We were in a meeting this morning. We're like, Hey, you know, that show that was like way down the road. Yeah. It's coming real quick. So yeah, it's, uh, it's shaping up. It's shaping up very nicely. It's the beginning of October. You can find out about it by going to our web- website at wispa.org or WISPA events um, and see you know what's up there. I think most of the agenda is published, still working on some aspects of it because we're in an industry where things change by the day. And so you, you want to get enough of it settled so that people know what to expect when they're coming. But at the same time, you got to be flexible because things are happening in real time. We're also updating our strategic plan for the next couple of years in particular <clears throat> with the realization of what mapping and what the be no foe mean uh, for us. Uh, but we're also looking at ways that we can expand the programs that WISPA offers to the WISP members, because in many cases, you know, the things that we're seeing our members face are going to be new to them. A year ago, they weren't worried about things like best practices, perhaps. And, you know, I know that sort of sounds governmental even to say that, but I think we learn from each other. And so to the extent that we can lever these experience uh, experiences a lot of times with the help of our vendor community, then that makes us as an industry stronger and more capable of carrying our message forward. So that, that didn't give you very much in terms of scoping that out for you, but I did at least want to make that statement that this is something that is front of mind for us and we're working hard on it. Yep. Yep. For sure. So and Las yep. Vegas is where we're going, by the way. So if anybody wanted to know where the show is, it's Las Vegas. Yep. And it's, you know, and we've said so many times in this podcast talking about the shows is, you know, the, the educational aspect of it would be hard to overstate. You know, there's yep. you know, a lot of people show up for the party and see the exhibit stuff and hang out with their friends. And that's great. Definitely do that. Right. But, you know, you've never had a better opportunity to not only sort of meet and congregate with your, your peers across the industry, but also, you know, get, you know, direct verbiage from you guys, you know, WISPA as a whole, you know, work on your state level, start building those relationships, you know, it's a relationship thing. And, you know, there, there's no better opportunity because that's where, you know, a lot of us are going to be there for sure. Yeah. And I mean, this community as a whole, right. I mean, we're, you know, another positive note and check in the box for the power that we have as wisps is our ability to work with each other. You know, it's really, I've I've never been part of an industry before where we can come together. I mean, I I think we have to stop looking at ourselves as our individual businesses, right? And look at our industry as a whole, right? You know, we're, you know, united, you know, we're strong, right? And the the relationships that you make at these shows um, and the amount of help and experience that you can get from your brother and sister wisps that are out there is just phenomenal. And that in itself, I mean, beyond all the education, everything else that happens there is, is something that, that I that I truly love about these shows. Uh, and I, I love seeing the new people who are coming into it. And, and it's almost wisp has kind of created now this ecosystem of support. It's just something that's now organic it's not something you guys necessarily plan for maybe it's something you can you can consider that uh, a little bit better of a mixer thing Um, but really it just organically flows people the experienced guys that are there come there and they want to teach the new guys right the new guys come there looking for information it just it just naturally happens and uh it's it's a huge brain share and it's a very powerful thing that you don't see in the other industries and the bigger industries they're all looking at how they're going to screw the other guy and make more money (laughs) and in this industry in the wisp industry we're we're looking at how we can help each other you know we're we're no longer competing against each other and it's a it's a wonderful thing 
Well, all right. So we've covered a lot of ground so far. I mean, we could sit here and probably talk for hours. I mean, there's spectrum uses, there's technology types, there's everything else. But, you know, I think we covered a lot of the big hot topic items uh, that's really on the, the, the forefront of everyone's thoughts and communication and stuff right now. And that's great. It was a great opportunity. Like I said, Wispapalooza is right around the corner. You know, great opportunity to meet those and, and talk about it in more detail. So... Uh, you know, if you guys are ready to put a bow on this, I think we're in a position to do so. So David, those of, uh, folks that are looking for you, what's the best way to get in touch with you or or track you down? So I'll give you an email address. Um, this is probably the easiest way, although I can have an overwhelmed inbox from time to time, but it's, it's dzumwalt at wispa.org. So D is in David and Z is my last name, Z-U-M-W-A-L-T. We'll, we'll throw it up there with our fancy the, editing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, feel free to reach out and I'll try to get you connected to whatever answer you need or whatever resource we can provide. Um, and that's probably the easiest way. Okay, great. Uh, any closing words that you want to throw out there before we wrap this up? Come to work every day willing to be surprised. I know I do. And um, I appreciate the time to be able to kind of convey this message uh, with you today. And I look forward to uh, seeing you at all at Wispapalooza and uh, continue to work on making mapping better and see where we can go with this speed NoFo. All right. Well, great. We, we really appreciate your time, your expertise, your knowledge, and we're looking forward to talking to you in the future about things. So thank you very much. I'd love to come back. Yep. No problem. Tassos, uh, where can folks find us? Yeah, they can find us anywhere on social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and of course on our website. So feel free to email or DM either Caleb or myself directly on social media. We're happy to help. And uh, also another thing, you know, we're always looking for new guests to be on our show. So it doesn't matter if you're a beginner or WIS, if you've been doing this forever, a hardware vendor in this space, whatever it is, uh, we want uh, to give exposure to this industry. Like I said, I mean, the, the, the best thing I love about this podcast is being able to really see people for who they are and get a better read on people and 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 basically you know see what they can do for you so yeah if you want to be on the show reach out to either myself or Caleb and uh, drop us a a DM or an email all right well until we talk to y'all next time y'all be good out there bye take care bye 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 thanks again